Welcome, everybody, to another episode of On Top and Hot. I'm your host, John Zadar, and today we have got a special show for you. We have got an exciting interview with a brand new company just on the market. This is Resilient Energy, ticker R-E-N-I. Now, Resilient Energy has been in the conventional oil and gas business in North America for over a decade and are now expanding into manufacturing and technology. Well, today we have a special guest with us from Rini to give us all the fresh, juicy info on this company. We are talking to the CFO of Resilient Energy, Mark Pindus. Did I pronounce that right? Uh, yes, you did. It's, it's Pindus, and I'm also the president of the company. Yeah, there you go. Well, thanks for being on the show. We sure appreciate your time. Now, Mark and I had originally planned on doing this interview a week ago, to be honest, but the company was in the midst of an acquisition and they were waiting for a press release to come out. So together we decided it would just be better to put it off until that press release came out so that we could dive into it and give you all the details. Well, over the last week or 10 days, Mark has been on a couple of YouTube and podcast shows and he's been alluding and hinting to this big deal. Well, the news came out the other day and there's no holds barred now. We can talk about it exclusively. I think we're the very first ones to get all the information. Yes, you are. So, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> but before we jump into dessert, we got to eat our meal first. You can't have any pudding until you eat your meat. <laughs> so, that, I think. Was it Pink Floyd? Was it? Yes, it was Pink Floyd. I knew you'd know. We're about the same age. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'm stating myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering how many of the viewers know the song at all. So yeah. before we jump into that, why don't we just start off at the beginning? Give us a little information about the company, where it's coming from, how you got involved with the company, and tell us about your partner, Mr. Bianco, as well. Sure, glad to. Um, Resilient Energy came out of the old Three Forks Inc. company. It's just a name change. It's the same company. And they were involved in various oil and gas projects. Um, mm -hmm. I had worked with that company and had left them, oh, I guess it's now 10 years ago. And about three or four years ago, uh, they came back to me. And uh, when oil crashed, um, they were falling a little bit on hard times. And they needed uh, to put things back together. And they were asking if I could do that. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to my friend uh, who's an investment banker by training, uh, training with a lot of experience in the oil and gas field, John Bianco, who serves as our CEO. Okay. And we looked at the company and we thought this was a great company to, to rebuild. It had a great platform, good shareholder base. Yeah. Um, had done some good things in the past. So we took them over and we decided uh, uh, they were always, uh, they had been reporting for a long time, but they were not training. So okay. we decided to get the ticker symbol going, which took a while. Yeah, um, I heard you had some fun with FINRA on that. Just getting your ticker took virtually a year, something uh, more, like that. More, more than that. It was, it was unusual for a lot of reasons, uh, not our fault. Um, right. It, it turned out that um, there was a huge backlog uh, at FINRA. Uh, COVID actually interfered a little bit because even FINRA, they had people working from home and it, it wasn't right. e efficient at all. Right. But, you know, in the end, they finally did right by us, as I said, and we got our ticker symbol. And a lot of our, yeah. A lot of our commitments were based on that. So, you know, this is making 2024 really our launch year. And right. we came on the market September of 2023. Uh, that's probably correct. It was, yeah, last last quarter, end of third quarter last year. Okay. And so we started getting things going. And uh, this quarter and the second quarter, we're going to be making our first acquisitions. We're really launching the company. We got a lot of equity and debt commitments uh, based on us, first of all, finding good acquisitions, number one. Number two, going public. So a lot of people are sort of waiting for this to happen. Um and, and for good reason, which is another discussion, the difference between being in a private company versus being in a public company. Oh, yeah. But um, it's a huge difference. In fact, our first acquisition, which, you know, we, we'll tease them a little bit more. Okay. Uh, the reason for that <laughs> is, is this is a company that did excellent things, excellent product line, great technology, 
Uh, they needed uh, an infusion of capital, and they decided that you know they wanted to find a public entity who was interested in taking them on because it's an easier way to raise capital. Oh yeah, and and that's we, we thought it would be a big mix, not only because they would have uh, they'd be giving resilient a separate revenue stream separate from oil and gas, but we can expand this company into the energy markets because a lot of people might not know this. But this technology is used to um, inspect oil fields, pipelines, and so forth. It's a much more efficient, cost-effective way um, than the old way. So whenever you're ready, I can tell, talk about what that is. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. You know, I, I was going to talk oil, but we can talk oil. That's no problem. But let's talk about this deal because we're right on the fringe of it. You are teasing everybody. And I don't think they have any more, any more patience to wait. So let's just jump in there and tell them what you've done. I am okay. excited about this. Okay. Well, on Wednesday, we issued a press release uh, announcing that we uh, signed a letter of intent to buy Challenger Aerospace. Right. Uh, that puts us in the drone business. Uh, their technology, yes, drones. Yes, drones. Um, like, uh, you know, everyone's talking AI, but drones is another area of technology that's very hot. Oh, it's and very hot. We don't even know everything we're going to do with them yet. No, it's it, it's basically up to our own imagination. And then we, we give the assignments to the engineers and they try to fit it into what's going on in our crazy minds. But um, this is a company that's been around for a while. Um, they needed that infusion of uh, capital. Uh, we've started already uh, helping them already with uh, some capital infusions. We're not, we haven't completed that uh, initial uh, infusion. There's still some things to, do, to go uh, right. through before the acquisition is complete, which we hope to finish in the next few weeks. Okay. Uh, and when we do that, we will file an 8K and, and we'll do all that kind of work. But um, the process has already started. Uh, we're very excited about this company. And uh, um, that's all I can tell you. We're in the drone business. So. <laughs> now, did they have a facility? Their facility is in uh, Nevada. Okay. Uh, um, that we have been looking to move them. Uh, we've been looking at Florida. Um, the, the reason is this company is going to be growing. And uh, there's better opportunities to attract labor in Florida. I don't know if people realize this, but uh, Florida has a lot. There's a, there's a, a lot of aerospace in Florida already. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> ex, ex, well, yeah, you know, and and in a lot of areas. So the opportunity to find personnel in that state is a little bit better than in Nevada at this point. I, I was reading about Challenger, and it was interesting. When we think of drones, we only think of flying drones. When this company has got drones for the ground, tanks like, they have boats that go on the water, probably going to push into submarines. I mean, drones are not just for the air. And this company has got nautical, surface, and aerial drones. Yes, which, they do. And, and they cover all sorts of things. As you can see by the pictures down there, folks, they've got big fat ones that carry heavy gear. They can spray chemicals. They can do mapping. There are so many things they can do, and we are just getting started with what they can do. And exactly. you've got a company building all of this already, not just designing it, actually prototyping it and get, getting their stuff out there. They have produced product for clients. Uh, that's what attracted us. The client base is incredible. Probably 80, 90 percent of the client base is government, either at the federal or local levels, including yeah. overseas. Some of our friends require this type of technology. Uh, some of the commercial clients are blue chip clients that everyone's probably heard of. Um, the, the big thing that this company has is proprietary technology in the area of uh, surveillance and reconnaissance. Um, it, it basically, it's a force multiplier for intelligence gathering and also force protection. It helps in security and law enforcement uh, issues and things. You know, Eyes in the sky, things. see everything. Yeah. I mean, I've been told because this company also makes the, uh, I don't know what they call those cameras that go on the bottom, those gyroscope cameras. And some of these cameras I was reading can read the date off a dime 18 miles away. I mean, talk about reconnaissance. Oh, my God. <laughs> They're good. I mean, brother They're good. is watching. Guaranteed. <laughs> They're good. They're good. Now, 
This is a revenue producing company. Uh, yes, um, they they do have revenue. Um, they've had revenue. That, like I said, they had needed a capital infusion. They had to go through some I readjustments. Know. So um, they had a, a couple down years, which created the opportunity for us. Uh, um, but uh, they have over $3 million in orders uh, now. Uh, the orders are still coming in, more inquiries. Um, it's sort of... Uh, you know they have a good base to start from, but we're, we're launching them sort of, sort of a relaunch type of uh, activity. So. Right. Okay. Now these contracts all come with the company. Everything they've got, That's all right. their assets, all the business. You're just picking it up where we, we, we have it. Now. Yeah, where we're going to have it. Yes. And you say in a couple of weeks this should be closed. Uh, next, I would say the next two to three weeks. Oh wow. That's a catalyst, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we're hoping. Uh, that's what we're things, are, things are moving along uh, nicely, and we hope that's when we complete the uh, all the all the paperwork that needs to be completed. Now, on the fringe, because you're making a deal here, you've got a great share structure, roughly twenty million outstanding, somewhere between five and six million in the float, which is really great. But obviously, a company that's starting making acquisitions, you use those shares. You've got uh, what is it, a hundred million authorized? Yes. So you've got shares that you can use as currency for deals and things like that. How much do you expect the share structure to change with these deals that that you're going to be making? Well, like all companies, it, it will change. I really don't know to what extent. We like to keep the outstanding shares low. You know, we don't want to be a penny stock forever. <laughs> you know, <We> don't either. <laughs> uh, you, you know, uh, people tend to overuse the the, the stock as, as currency. And the more you put out there, the less valuable it is. You know, That's right. So you have to be judicious in your use of, of that type of way to acquire companies. Uh, we'll do it like everyone else, but we're going to try to be conservative about it and make sure we keep the, the outstanding shares and, uh, and commensurate with the size of the company. You'll probably be working more with uh, restricted shares with uh, yes. lots of periods and things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And the one question I don't have to ask your company, any plans of a reverse split? <laughs> you know, we've had a lot of those in the last couple of years. None. But None. No, of course you don't. Not at this point of the game. None. <laughs> All right. So let's back up a little bit. You were saying that, and you had hinted that these drones can be used in the oil sector. Sure. And I have read a lot about that, how they use them for security and all sorts of other things. The agriculture use them. There is just so many di different things. So you do have some overlapping with yes. your drones and your oil. Yeah. Now, the oil is your primary focus, um, yes. production oil here in North America, oil fields that have been producing for a long time, making revenues. You're going to step in, get those three, five, 30 oil uh, rigs and bring your special technology to help them produce more oil. So you're stepping into another business that is already generating revenue. Yes. Basically, that's it. We have probably the lowest cost model uh, out there. We buy production that we can increase from existing wells by right. adding technologies or reinvigorating wells or working them over. And usually the, the properties we like uh, also have uh, proven undeveloped uh, sites on the property where we can drill uh, new wells. Okay. And get the value of the property up uh, quickly. Uh, so, you know, we also look at traditional plays that are low cost, low maintenance, uh, which means vertical plays as opposed to horizontal drilling, which is more okay. expensive. We don't do the tight, uh, tight oil or deep shale. They tend to be sites that are under 7,000 feet. Keep it simple. <laughs> keep it simple. Keep it simple because, you know, the price of oil is set in the marketplace. And if you have a lower cost operation, your margins are going to be bigger. Right. And the, the big shale producers, uh, you know, at $70, $60 a barrel, they don't really make money. Uh, their costs are too high. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that do make money, it's very little. But, you know, we would make money at, you know, $35 a barrel because our model is that much better, we think. Yeah. Right. Do you have any, your eye on any properties? 
for we oil? Are, we're looking at three properties right now that are very exciting. We hope to announce uh, that uh, an acquisition there, mm -hmm. hopefully in the next six weeks or so. Yeah. Can you tell us what states they're in? Are they all in the U.S.? They are all, well, two of the three are in the U.S. Uh -huh. um, these properties would be in Louisiana. So, <laughs> Louisiana. Yeah. I thought I heard you mention on one of your other broadcasts, Texas. We are looking at some properties in Texas, but those might come later. I think uh, the properties we're looking at in Louisiana came to the top of the pile. So, excellent. <laughs> excellent. So, the fact that your business is focusing on businesses that already are generating revenues, you should be in re revenues by next quarter. We, we should see something on the books. Yes, I would. I would think so. Yes, that's what our plan is. So we stay according to schedule, see revenues in, in second quarter. Yeah. Got any ideas how many zeros we'll be looking at? I don't want to speculate. <laughs> Fair enough. We got an open book on a lot of topics here. That's okay. Speculation is a little dangerous. People like to hold you to these things. So exactly. You know, yeah, it's just best not to say it. Yeah. So being an insider, you know everything that's going on. You know what we have the right to know. Is there anything that I haven't brought up that you can share with us? Well, you know, the character of this company's changed. It was just oil and gas. And right. we looked at the marketplace and, and those markets, as we know, are volatile and they're volatile and they're changing. Yes. So to be fair to our shareholders, we have to broaden our, our sites. Uh, this first acquisition is an attempt to get into another area that we think can complement oil and gas and also stand on its own. Mm -hmm. But the energy markets are changing. And we are not against renewable energy. We're looking at a couple of uh, projects there in alternative fuels mm -hmm. uh, oh, good. that are exciting. Um, we mm. think oil and gas will be part of the marketplace and the energy grid for years to come. Oh, absolutely. Oil but, and gas isn't going anywhere. We may not use it for our cars, but there is lots of other reasons we use it. Exactly. But it's it's going to be a mix. And, yeah. And you yeah. have to... and and. It's nice to have other sources of revenue and to be in different marketplaces. So we want to identify ourselves as an energy company as well, not just an oil and gas company. And that's the way that new management is changing the focus of this company a little bit, which we think ultimately will be much better for the shareholders. I think it's a wise move. Oil and gas can be very profitable, but it is volatile. It has some big dips and big jumps. Yes. And to keep things safe, to mitigate the risk, you need to be diversified into something else that's more reliable, more steady, something that you don't have the volatility in. And with the overlapping of the two businesses that you're looking at, I don't know what your plans are, but there's room there for plans. Absolutely. There's a lot of things we can do. And we're not going to pretend that we know everything about everything. John and myself have a background in more finance uh, than we do in, in, in engineering, for example, or technology. But so we recognize that with some of these acquisitions, we also want to acquire the talent to add to the, the company so we get the best people doing what they're supposed to do. Um, down the road, I'd love to have a product guy on uh, from Challenger uh, talking to you about specifics about the product because he's a lot more qualified than I am. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. I, I'd feel a little out of my zone, but that would be fun. I'd like that. This one, yeah, I, I like learning. I like seeing new things and I get impressed with technology. And just when I think I, I know a lot about something, I'll dive into it and say, wow. You know, uh, so we need to get the experts and uh, we're not going to pretend we know everything. We're going to we're going to acquire. No, but you are things. businessmen. You yeah. and John have business experience where, as I was listening a lot of oil companies were failing because they didn't have the finance experience. They didn't have that knowledge. They knew about oil. They knew what to do to get the oil out of the ground, but how to keep the business afloat, they couldn't do. So you're actually ahead of the oil game just because you understand the business side of it. It always amazed me, and this is true in real estate too. You see oil going up and up and you see real estate going up and up as we re remember prior to 2007. Mm -hmm. And you actually would hear people on TV thinking that, it's going to continue. 
It never works that way. You know, it goes through cycles for a variety of reasons. And yeah. in oil. And what a lot of people did is when oil was at 90 and 100 and $110 a barrel, they were borrowing money based on those numbers. So when the numbers come down to 30 and $40 a barrel, they got stuck. Um, and what was it during COVID? Did, didn't it actually go under zero? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the futures market, you know, went. so you know, these people still have to pay the banks back, you know, and so that affected the financial markets to to fund new oil projects because nobody wanted to do it anymore for a while. So, yeah, you got to be smart in the way you use leverage and you got to know how to hedge. And um, we don't want to get into trouble like those other guys did. We're well aware of it. I, I we know the history of the the industry, and we don't want to be one of those people who repeat the bad things. <laughs> right, having the uh, having knowledge on both sides of the coins is what what you need. You got to understand the oil business, and you got to understand the financial aspect of it because there is a lot of volatility. It's not just about America; it is a global situation that can change just like that. Look, there's a lot of science into. Uh, being able to extract uh, oil and gas from the ground, that's, that, that, that kind of expertise is invaluable. But they'll keep doing it whether they make money or not. The people who really control how things go are the people financing this stuff. So and you, you guys have, have a new technology that helps these, these oil companies to get more oil out of the ground. So there, just there's a lot of technology available and we'll have access to a lot of it. Again, the engineers are better talking about it than I can, but and in terms of knowing how to pressurize a well properly, finding the oil, uh, getting it out of the ground, knowing how to treat a well, there's there's a lot of advanced technologies out there. And one of the things about some of the properties that we go uh, after are older properties. They're owned sometimes by families. Probably, I think, something like 20 or 30 percent of the oil produced in this country are just people drilling on privately owned land, you know, wow. small little properties. A lot of them started several generations ago when the technology wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just let the wells go. Maybe they might put a new pump on or something, but they didn't want to make that kind of investment. Sure. And they never really were able to get the most out of those properties that they could have. You make so, it sound like these wells go for decades. There, there are some wells still producing after 70 years. Wow. It's very different from the the shale business, which has low decline rates. Right. A lot of the traditional, uh, for example, in the, the famous base and the biggest one in the United States, the Permian Basin out in Texas, right? there are wells there that um, still produce a couple, you know, a barrel or two a day that were drilled 70 years ago. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really, it's amazing. It, some of these wells also uh, get recharged somehow. You think you, not all wells get empty. Some get refed. Believe it or not, and that's what keep keeps the the the, the pumps going sometimes. Sure, um, like lake with uh, streams and rivers. If yeah, there, there's some in the mountains. The lake fills up. Yeah, but th these these wells keep producing. They don't cost much to to maintain uh, once right. you get them going. They yeah. uh, you get probably a, uh, the highest production in the first seven years before things start to tail off a little bit. But they'll go on for a long time, these these types of wells that, that excuse me, the ones that we like. So, yeah. Well, it sounds like we've got things moving in the right direction that are supposed to be happening in a very short period of time here. Um, the share structure is awesome. I love, I love a low float. Yes. And you've got a low float right now. Don't know how long it's going to last, but your low float will change when your company's getting bigger. So it's all going to be proportionate. So yeah. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, it's and going to be commensurate with the size of the company. We're just not going to throw shares out into the marketplace for no reason. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be under control. Yeah, that is one of the nice things about you just coming onto the market. There's a lot of companies that are struggling to keep their heads above water. And the only thing they can do is throw more shares on the market. Whether they're doing good business or not, market sentiment's dragging them down, which is a horrible thing for a good company to have to go through. Look, you know, we, we're on these shows because we want people to invest in the company. We want people to know about the company. We like long players. Um, and we're happy to have people uh, buy shares in the company. Yeah, we know there are traders out there, and, and that's fine. 
Uh, but when it comes to my job and John's job, um, we just want to run a good company and let the stock take care of itself. You know, uh, it'll Absolutely. be me, you know, so we, we welcome our shareholders. We, we want to make money for you, but uh, you can buy and sell on your own. It's up to you. <laughs> I noticed you have roughly 400 shareholders right now. Uh, we may have some more now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I checked those numbers out on penny stocks and yeah. most people never know. You just presume there must be thousands of people in this company. You'd be amazed how many companies have less than 50 people investing in them. So when I saw 400 for a company that's just gotten on the market, I was excited by that. Well, that was the attraction of this of, of taking this company public, quite frankly, was that it had a 400 shareholder base. Um, you have to have a minimum, as you know, you have to have a minimum amount of shareholders to, to bring it on the market. And even if yeah. that wasn't required, it's a good thing to have because you want to create um, a shareholder base in a public market. So there is trading. So there is activity in the stock. Right. So being a company that has 400 shareholders to start with was very attractive. And we're getting more. And we're getting more. We have more. We had a good trading day. Not, I don't think it traded so much on Friday, but Thursday was a very nice trading day. And it's, it's, it's starting, you know. So, Yeah, I seen we had a little bit of a dip, but that's the market, up and down, up and down. But with catalysts, with growth, and being in the drone sector, the drone sector is getting a lot of attention. There's quite a few drone companies out there. Bunch of them are working with the government, working with the military, and that is catching a lot of people's eye because we know the market is going to explode. And there is room for all sorts of growth out there right now. And when I saw all the different types of drones that Challenger has, it was like they're just not focused on one little streamline or no. one. No, they've got, <laughs> they've got a variety of drones that do all sorts of things, look different, are Different sizes. They got one that goes 75 miles an hour, and it's the size of a pelican. It's like, for God's sake, that thing's pregnant. How can it go 75 miles per hour? So it's exciting to see a new drone company coming onto the market that's already established with products. It's got nowhere to go but up. <laughs> it's a drone company. <laughs> no pun intended, right? No pun yeah. intended. But no, you know, we're, we're buying properties and we're making acquisitions that are going to give the company value. And uh, we make uh, money, stock's going to go up. We lose money, it goes down. So my job is to make sure the company's profitable, and we expect to see that in short order. Sounds like it. Well, I hope when things start moving ahead, you've got more time for us. I would love to have you back on the show. Love I'm to excited back. to share this company with the investors. New companies are always exciting. We've seen a lot of new IPOs that have come on the market that have really suffered. I mean, it's a horrible thing to see a bounce the first day and drop the next 30. But these are buying opportunities. Companies that have got business. You've got business that you're clicking into that's going to make revenues as soon as you're in. That's what I appreciate. I am looking for companies making money. All this exploration, all this due diligence, that's good. It's necessary. But- in this market, I need to be with a company that is growing now. And as you I've saw said before, quite a not, not to interrupt you, John, but as I've said before, and as you know from looking at some of my other um, interviews, uh, we do not we do not want to buy anything that won't be profitable in the near term, either profitable right away or, you know, right. Uh, you're you know, buy the company that. or in the next three or four months or five or six months, a company that's going to be profitable in three or four years, we're not interested in. So, Very good. So I just want to point that out, that we're looking to get revenue right away. So, You heard it, folks. Money fast. That's what we're looking for. Companies that are making revenues, companies that are making acquisitions with established manufacturing. They're already making their products. They've already got customers. They're already selling them. This is real exciting, and I can't wait for it to close so that we can see where you go with this. Well, that's a few weeks away, but uh, it's coming fast. So we, yeah, we have a well, lot of work to do. Weeks go by like days right now. I yeah, mean, exactly. I can't yeah. believe it is now 2024, and it looks like the end of winter. It's like, didn't we just come into winter? That's what happens when you get old. Time flies. <laughs> it really does. I agree. Well, with you. Thank you for being on the show, Mark. We appreciate all the information you have shared with us. 
Whenever you want to come back, reach out. I will schedule you in and we will talk to the investors again. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Remember, you can get more information about Resilient Energy from their website, resilientenergyinc.com. You can also go to their Twitter account, get lots of information. Now would be the time to look at it, folks, before they close this deal. We will see you soon. Remember, folks, the more you know, the more you're going to grow. See ya.